All right, good evening, good evening. Today is August 1st, 2019. This is Oscar Mike Radio. Oscar Mike Radio is on the move, on mission for our veterans. And this is number 158. And I'm pleased to have with me Marine veteran, Nashville resident, and you know, multi-talented man, Andrew Farr on Oscar Mike Radio. Andrew, welcome. Hey, good evening. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, looking forward to talking with you about what you're getting ready to do. But before we do, just want to give a big shout out to my sponsor, Joyce Asak of Asak Realty. Hi, this is Joyce Asak with Remax Synergy. I am a real estate agent that services the South Shore. You can follow me on Facebook or Instagram by following Joyce Asak at Asak Real Estate or my website, asakrealestate.com. You can also reach me directly at 508-942-7146. For any buyers or sellers that I'll be working with in 2019, a donation will be made in their name to 22 Kill. You know, Andrew, we're we're on Facebook and, and we're kind of chatting around. All of a sudden, this this guy hits me up. I think it, well, actually, it was Instagram actually, which was kind of it funny. was it was kind of funny. And and you were talking about the fact that you're doing th- this cool thing in in Nashville with the Silkies. Before we get into that, I, I was kind of curious because a lot of what Oscar Mike Mike Radio is about is veterans like yourself who who do these things and do different things either with a, a nonprofit or a business or a complete redo of their career path. So I kind of want to start with the beginning and, and can you kind of just summarize or tell us what you did in the Marine Corps? Uh, well, um, I joined at 26 years old. Uh, I'd already previously graduated from college, uh, Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida, uh, classical studies major. Uh, graduated, uh, worked for Sir Williams for about three and a half years and, uh, got the bug and wanted to serve my country before, you know, I was 30 years old. My dad, he was a uh, Lieutenant commander in the Navy. My uncle was in Vietnam, uh, signal Corps. And so I, I got the bug. I was like, I got to do this before I'm 30 years old. So I joined, uh, took a lunch break, uh, from my job. I went down to the recruiting office. Um, and in June of 2004, I was aboard that bus to go to Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island. 2004. Um, 2004, yeah. Wow, okay. Uh, the summer, it sucked. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I know, man, I hate the heat. I, because of Paris Island, I hate everything hot. Um, so uh, I joined. Uh, I joined. Uh, I was with Second Battalion, Fox Company, 281. Was there for 13 weeks. Graduated. Then went to SOI, uh, School of Infantry, uh, Camp Geiger, uh, Delta Company, and then that was for two months. And then, um, you know, come Christmas time, they they put me with Third Battalion, Eighth Marines, India Company, and that was uh, the unit that I arrived at, and I was there for for four years. We uh, we did. Um, Operation Iraqi Freedom uh, in Karma, Iraq, in 2005. We did the Battle of Ramadi in 2006. Uh, that sucked. And then um, in 2007, we were aboard the USS Kearsarge for the 22nd Mule. And then after that, uh, I got out. So you get out. Now, were you from the Nashville area originally, or did you move there after you transitioned? I actually, um, it's a funny story. I was born here in 77, but... Uh, was raised in Exeter, New Hampshire. Um, went to high school uh, in Massachusetts, um, in North Andover. Um, and then, um, you know, when I went to college, we moved down to Savannah, Georgia. So I'm kind of like half Southern, half Yankee. Uh, no offense to the Yankee listeners. I'm, I'm half of you. I love the Bruins. I love the Celtics. love the Red Sox. So I'm New Englander, but half, half a New Englander. Gotcha. So. Gotcha. So you get out and, and... – you transitioned. What did you What did you start first do when you got out? Uh, I was unemployed. Um, I was a raging alcoholic at the time. Um, we saw a lot of bad. Uh, I could. Can I swear on this or no? Oh yeah, this this is a swear swearing zone. Okay. Yeah, I saw a lot of bad shit. Um, well, I mean, my dad committed suicide in boot camp. Had to deal with that, which I really didn't deal with it until after I got out, um, and then. During my deployments, we lost eight the first deployment, and then uh, 17, 
the second deployment in Ramadi. Um, I was a machine gunner, uh, you know, with uh, uh, second uh, God uh, second platoon. And so, yeah, um, it kind of messed with my head. Um, I was unemployed uh, for the first three or four months after I got out. Um, raging alcoholic. I've been drinking since I was eight years old, but it really, really took a hold like college and, and Marine Corps. And my drinking became um, unhealthy. Um, and I'm actually, I'm, I'll be a year sober tomorrow. So I've, uh, oh, it's been a long, it's been a long road. I've, I've gone through AA like, this is my fifth time going through AA. So it's been, it's, it's being an alcoholic, man, sucks. Okay. Cause we crave alcohol all the time. And it's, it's tough, especially when you lose a lot of your buddies and they're buried in Arlington, Virginia. And, um, you know, your dad dies, your brother dies. You, you have a son in between deployments and he dies. Uh, it's, it's just, it's a lot to deal with, uh, for a 26 year old, which, you know, uh, some people deal with it in their way. I, I didn't have the coping skills. I didn't have the support. So I went off a handle and, um, I was a mess. I almost lost my family. I almost, I almost died. I actually tried to kill myself in 2009. Um, was Baker acted in, in, uh, Statesboro, Georgia for three days. So yeah, it, it uh, it was a rough ride, uh, getting out. When did it start to turn around for you? Was it was it the AA support or just being able to really say to yourself, I've hit rock bottom and I want to come back out? What, what was it for you? It was the rock bottom. Um, I've, I've had a couple rock bottoms, and I guess that first one wasn't as rock bottom as the one I just had because um, I was two and a half years sober, um, you know, after getting out of the core and, and working a little bit, and I was a chef for 10 years, and I came back here to Tennessee, and I'd been sober two and a half years. Well, I didn't have, um, I didn't call my sponsor one morning, and um, I should have called my sponsor, uh, because at the end of the day, I had a .234 blood alcohol content uh, DUI. I actually passed out in the uh, officer's car. Uh, I got out of my car, and I told him, I was like, hey, I don't need a sobriety uh, check. Just take me to jail. And then I passed out in his back seat and woke up in jail. And then, uh, you know, the next morning, my wife, uh, who I just married uh, a year ago, a uh, great woman, she picked me up from jail. And when you have to see your wife's face pick you up from jail, um, it definitely leaves an imprint on you and uh, makes you think about your con- uh, your behavior and the consequences from that behavior. So your your wife sticks by you, you hit bottom, and you start coming out, and it seems like, talking to you before we, we are doing this now, that you've gotten on this good path, this sober path, and part of that has to do with the fact that you're helping put on or putting on the irreverent warrior silky hike in, in Nashville, and, and has that helped you at all? Oh, yeah. Um it helps, yeah. It's uh, it's very time-consuming being a coordinator. I'll tell you that. I give a lot of props to the other, you know, 79 coordinators that we have uh, in the IW community. But Cindy, the president, she uh, she gave me the good to go in January, and I have uh, all my time, most of my time, actually 92% of my time is 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 allotted to. The Irreverent Warriors and getting the hike ready. And I mean, basically, I feel like a damn first sergeant or, or a sergeant major, you know, getting ready for one of those company hikes. Like, you got to have EMTs. Like, like, logistically, it's a freaking nightmare. You got to do safety vehicles, EMTs. You got to get permits for where you're going to be at. I mean, it's, I've, uh, I've learned a lot along the way, but uh, I'm really glad I'm involved with this, uh, with this 5013C because. They they bring veterans together using humor and camaraderie and and once you do a couple hikes you're part of that family and and you know we used to be part of a tribe you know Marine Corps or any branch of service and when we get out you're not part of a tribe anymore but I W is a tribe I W I W saved me um, they make me want to to be better they make me. They make me. They made me be better. That I've gotten into graduate school, 
for uh, uh, addiction counseling. Um, I want to work for the mental health team that IW is going to be starting very soon. Um, I want to be a peer certified resource specialist and, and help our fellow vets that are, you know, are struggling with alcohol addiction, drug addiction, um, you know, and, and to be a, a, a voice that they can talk to, be a shoulder that they can lean on. One of the things, Andrew, that I pick up from veterans like myself and other people I talk to is what you, you touched on earlier. It's that lack of esprit de corps they feel outside the military that they yes. that, they, that they lose. And, and I, I had to admit to myself is for whatever reason, I don't know why it is, I am more comfortable. And I, I didn't stay in that long, but I am more comfortable around other veterans of any rank than I am my civilian counterparts. And I don't know why and that I, is. And I totally agree with that statement because – these civilians, I mean, no offense to civilians, but they don't know what we've been through. Um, like the best, and I've heard this, and this is probably, you know, a broken record, but it's it's a very important broken record. The best support for a veteran is a fellow veteran because we've been there. We've done that. Even if they haven't even deployed, going to boot camp, I mean, that right there is an eye-opener. And, I mean, I'm tw- I, get this. I was 26 years old, all right? And we're at the moment of truth. Remember that, oh, Travis, yes. back yes. in the day? Yes. The moment yeah, the moment of truth when they, they're like, have you done anything wrong? Because if you lie to us, that means that you're out, you're going home. I'm, you know, they give us time to, to put our heads on the desk. <laughs> and I'm putting my head on the desk, and I was like, what the fuck did I just do? And you know what? I'm glad I did it because, I, I you know, I turned out to be a pretty good Marine. Uh, got a Purple Heart in 2006, good conduct medal, um, humanitarian assistance, you know, uh, hearts and minds, you know, and a college degree. Uh, but, you know, I didn't, uh, I was not, I didn't have the tools after I got out to make me successful. And what, okay, so when you say tools, and that's a very good analogy, what do you mean by tools? What tools do a lot of veterans lack and they start getting astray or, you know, withdrawn and, 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 and insular? They don't want to, you know, socialize with other people or, you know, can't really, you know, adjust. Right. No, no. Um, that's a great question. Uh, the tools, um, some, you know, stuff, because I've been in cognitive behavioral therapy for a long time. CBT is a tool. Um, you know, um, any, any, any support system that you have, that can be used as a tool. Um, edu- you know, educating the people getting out, like during sets and taps, and not just sitting around and waiting to, to get off Camp Lejeune. Actually teaching them how to, you know, write a resume or, um, you know, how to speak in front of 200 people, which um, when I was drunk or drinking, that was really good. That is, that's actually one of my fears is, is public speaking. Um, and I've, I've learned through trial and error that, uh, you know, um, I can get it done, but I hate doing it. Like, I mean, you know, in cognitive behavioral therapy, we're doing some of this stuff where, you know, you have to, you know, find your, your assets, find your, your liabilities of, you know, what makes you you. And um, one of the assets that I have is I'm a very good writer. But when it comes to speaking, I was I was really good back in like the eighth grade, and then I don't know. Um, I just I, I you know I, I don't know. I kind of um, so, I kind of get a little nervous uh, when I have to uh, talk in front of a lot of people. What is it? What is and, it about? Um, no, what is it about? It's just uh, what is it about? I don't know. It, it, it's it, it's a learning curve, I guess. You're not you're not the first person that. And first person and, and military, especially, who's told me that. And, and you know, like we talked about before, and, you know, I, I knew the, the NCO and even an officer who's like, you know, getting up in front of my platoon is one thing. You know, I, I know them, I can talk to them, and I'm comfortable. But getting up yeah. in front of, you know, people I don't know petrifies me. And it's hard for, you know, my brethren to admit that. So just admitting that is a huge step forward. So... I guess what I would say to you, if I can, you know, offer some advice on the podcast. Of course. Well, no, I, I, I would welcome it. Is 
I, I want you to kind of think of it as there's a whole ton of people out there you got to talk to, and they're yep. waiting on, on what you're doing, and they're looking at you. But the reality is, you know, they'll understand if you have to pause or even, you know, skip a word or two, but they're looking for connection. So what I what I've told these two guys to do is find find a couple people in the audience, one to your left, one to your right, and a couple in the center, and kind of talk to them, right? If you talk to them and the other people aren't going to know that you're talking to that one person, they're going to see you moving your head in that direction. It's going to be a connection. And if you focus on that yeah. one person, you're going to be able to kind of block out the other people but connect with them. And a lot of it, too, is just practice, man, and exposure. But I, I think yeah. it's it's a very real thing. I know a lot of people and some civilians who are very educated. They're very professional. And you got to get them in front of a, a group of a, a room full of people to talk about a presentation or a report. And, and they're petrified. They're petrified. And, and, and I think for, for you, it just connects with me because there's some things that I don't like doing. I don't like shots. I don't like going to the doctor. I hate it. I, I hate it. it yeah, it messes me I up. agree with that one, too. Amen. But um, for you. For you and what you're doing with Reverend Warriors, I think that, you know, trying to not have to, but working through that will help you, you know, conduct your mission more effectively. And, and, and it's you have a great story to tell. And, you know, speaking of that, how has this whole process of starting out in January, how, how did it come to you that you wanted to be involved with Reverend Warriors? And what, what was that? What was that like? What was that like? It was, um, well, um you know, when I heard, I, I didn't even know about a rep warriors until, um, two years ago, I heard about it. Um, they had a different president back then. Um, and I asked him, I was like, Hey, can I, you know, I was living, you know, in Madison, Tennessee, right. You know, a suburb right outside of Nashville. And I was like, Hey, can I, you know, I, I'd like to do a, a, a hike, um, you know, in Nashville. Well, you know, I never heard back from, um, and so I, I actually went to my first – my first hike was in Savannah, Georgia uh, last year, and it was it was the best time I've ever had. I mean, getting getting the veterans together and, and telling stories. And, and actually, last year I was I was drinking a lot um, in Savannah. Um, actually, got pretty got pretty got pretty hammered uh, <laughs> even before we you know hit the first you know three miles um, because you know. Uh, back then it was it was more of a more of a drinking thing and and now the uh the ties have turned a little bit we have a different leadership and a different mission and our mission now is you know um you know it's not it's not a pub crawl it's not this it's we bring veterans together and we share stories and we lean on each other and you know i've i've been to since the Cincinnati hike this year i went to the Nebraska hike this year and I cried at both of them, and um, you know it was it just it's a it's a really good feeling to be around your brothers and who who've been in the mud, you know, and they've got your six and they've got your left and they've got your right. Um, but I don't know. I just uh, I heard about I heard about them two years ago, and 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 like I said, my I didn't know about suicide. I, I didn't like when I was growing up. Nobody nobody around me, you know, I've never heard about anything suicide related growing up in New Hampshire. Um, it wasn't until, um, boot camp until my dad, you know, um, he hung himself, um, when he was, um, uh, in upstate New York. Sorry. It's a little tough for me. No, 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 no problem, my, uh, my mom and brother, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my mom and brother found the body and I was second month of boot camp. So I was, you know, obviously, you know, what second month is that's rifle range. Right. Uh, we were out there, we were practicing, and then we came back to Mainside um, to get ready uh, for the next whatever, next escalation or whatever. And um, I get, uh, you know, I hear this, uh, far, get into my office. And I was like, okay. Uh, you know, it was the senior drill, so you, you know, you knock three times on the door, and, you know, they say, come in. And I see my, my senior drill in one corner, and then I see, the chaplain in the other corner. And I was like, I said to myself, I was like, holy shit. 
somebody's died or something's really wrong. And uh, they're like, yeah, you better call your mom. And so I got, you know, uh, they gave me a, the Red Cross message and I called my mom and my dad had hung himself, um, hanged himself, sorry. Um, hush, hush. And uh, uh, he, um, I went up to, uh, I, I got, I got leave uh, for a weekend to go and bury my father uh, up in uh, Saratoga Springs, New York, and uh, then came back to boot camp, uh, finished uh, finished boot camp, and then I just I rolled on like nothing had just happened because, you know, in the Marine Corps it's it's mission first and then everything else comes after that, but we were so uh, we were so mission heavy in the second MEF. We were the most deployed unit in the second MEF. We had just come back from Haiti. Then we went to Iraq, then five months. Then we went to Iraq again, then 10 months. Then we went on a mule. I mean, deployment tempo was huge. I didn't have time to breathe, let alone, um, you know, think about all the loss and, you know, my father. And, um, you know, I was married the first time when I was, a, when I was in uh, the core, uh, I was only married for two years. Um, we had a child and, that child died the day after he was born, um, and then I went on the mule. Uh, so I didn't have time to think about that either. But as soon as I got out, oh, man, my brain, we had nothing to do. I had nothing to do. I was stagnant. Um, I wasn't working out. Um, and I just, my brain kept on thinking about everybody that, that I've lost. I mean, I lost friends in Iraq. I lost my father. I lost my my son. I lost you know, and then, you know, 2014, my brother dies of colon cancer. So, you know, for 10 years after I got out of the core, it was still pretty, you know, messed up. So what you're saying is there, there was really no time for Andrew to sit down and process this. Sure, you're around other Marines, but you didn't get the time alone to work through this. Were there, were there, counseling options available or was it just you were too busy all the time on mission to sit down and take care of yourself? no we were no we were we were i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but yeah we were way too busy i mean we had you know the check in the box uh safety stand down we had to uh we were on air alert for a little bit um i mean it was a uh, it was continuous i mean first deployment was six months uh you know second deployment was six and a half third deployment was seven um i mean you know and that 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 training before the mew i mean that was you know i mean we were doing some every single day yeah we had leave uh but it wasn't long enough we did you know left seat right seat leave um it just you know there was um i didn't even you know but i didn't even think there was a problem because i wasn't even thinking about it because i was thinking about the mission you know it just uh i wish um you know, I did have to go to the substance abuse uh, counseling officer, uh, the SACO, because um, I did get NJP for drinking in Iraq, uh, my first deployment. That, that's another story. If we if we have time, I'll tell you about that, but that was a little fucked up, too. <laughs> we'll have you back on and save it for next time. I, I'm just it, – it just seems like you've taken a lot of hits physically and emotionally, psychologically, and you got to the bottom. It's understandable why you got there. And it sounds like that your current wife really stuck by you through thin and through thick. There's not a lot of those around. And then you no. you're able to get into some kind of counseling situation. Am I right about that? It's, it's, that's what you're yeah, actually, um, actually getting uh, – sorry to interrupt, Travis, no. but getting that DUI 11 months ago, was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, I'm actually, um, I'm in veterans treatment court. It's an 18 month program. And from what I've been told, uh, 18 months is the appropriate time um, for a body to get rid of um, the old ways and make, make room for the new habits. Um, it takes 18 months for the brain. And that's, I think you can find that in the DFM or or any of the, the counselors that you talk to, 18 months is now, I think, the standard for treatment uh, of any kind of addiction. Because, you know, uh, six months, yeah, that's great. You know, that's that's a good start. But 18 months, after six months, you start making habits. and But you have to keep on doing it until, you know, 
those old habits, you know, you have the tools like we talked about before, you have the tools to battle those old habits because, you know, when it comes, I mean, when it comes to drugs and alcohol, that is like, it's like a little demon on your back and he's pumping iron. He's getting ready to come out and he's getting ready to, he's like, he wants a craving and he's working out and he's getting ready for it. But you've got to take your tools and try and subside that demon, that addiction that is behind you, you know, you know, find new pl- uh, people, places and things, um, you know, hang out at different places. Um, you know, don't, you know, get, get new, new friends that won't enable you to, to drink or to, to use or whatever. Um, well, let me, let me ask you this. Um, and, and, you know, sorry, I'm sounding like a damn, I, I sound like my damn counselor right now. <laughs> well, I think it's a message that people need to hear. Uh, I talk to a lot of people, you know, outside of the podcast and other things that I do who are struggling with this and, and won't make the change. And, and this next question is kind of maybe going to help me get some perspective. I, I'm told now uh, that, that addiction is disease. And, and I'll tell you honestly, Andrew, I don't, I don't believe that. I believe, and, if, and what I'm saying is, why I'm asking this is if you think I'm wrong or misinformed, you know, correct me. But my reasoning for not believing it's disease is that person made the choice to, to take that drug or take that drink the first time. And they kept making the choice to go back to it. Now, I understand there's a certain point where the body says, hey, I need that all the time. And their mind tells them they need it. But it, it's not like I can, can go down to the bus stop and catch alcoholism on the bus stop waiting for the bus. No, 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 no. no. See, no, I totally agree with what you're saying right now. Um, you know, um, alcoholism, and that's, that's that my drug of choice was alcohol. So um, in the big book, in, in the AA big book, they say that alcoholism is, is, is a disease. Um, okay. Well, I mean, there is there has been some cases where you know people are predisposed to genetically predisposed to alcoholism, okay. alcoholism, um, but some of them don't turn out to be alcoholics because you're right. There's that choice, that choice to be made: am I going to drink or am I not? But an alcohol, and alcohol, and I learned this, I learned that this year, and this actually. It's actually is really smart, and my my social worker, uh, I, I really I really really like what he said. But an alcoholic is made. Now I don't know if this can be used for for drug addiction too, but an alcoholic is made through quantity and frequency of use. Okay. And and now having you know making that choice to do that that is on the person. Um, some people are more predisposed for alcoholism, but they still have that choice. Some people that I know, you know, their, their dad was drunk. My, my father, I don't know if he, if he used a lot or not. Um, I was, I was too busy playing hockey and and rowing and and stuff like that to, to even, you know, consider that. But some people, they choose to go down that path. They have that choice. Some people do not. Um, I, I took that choice. But I used a lot. I mean, my first drink was at, you know, eight years old, up in, up in you know, in in Tennessee, and then uh, I drank in high school. I drank in college a lot. I mean, that's why I took five years to graduate college. Um, I was in a fraternity, and that's all I want. All I wanted to do was party. And then, uh, you know, I, you know, even when I was working at Sherwin Williams after college. Um, I party in Naples, Florida. I mean, you know, you have to party in Naples. I mean, you know, you go down Park Ave and, and Third. I mean, it's nothing but bars. It was, you know, it was a paradise. And I was single and making like thirty-five thousand a year. It was great, but it was uh, it's really bad because I drank a lot and I did a lot of bad things uh, in Naples. Um, yeah, you know, and then I, you know, then I, you know, I sobered for you know, I was sober for like thirteen weeks during boot camp. Um, drank during SOI, uh, got got NJP for drinking in Iraq, uh, but still got a good cookie, uh, a good conduct medal um, after the Marine Corps or during the Marine Corps because I, I got in trouble the first year, and my third year, uh, my the, the next three years I was good, so I got my good cookie. But 
you know, and then after that, I just, you know, everything caught up and I decided to drink more and more and more. And that, that, that became, became a habit for me. And when it becomes a habit, that's when you become an alcoholic, when you crave it, when you wake up first thing in the morning and say, I want a Bloody Mary, I want pure grain alcohol. You know, I'm going to take a couple shots just because I, I need to make a speech today. I've got to, you know, I've got to have a little liquid courage, but you are totally right. Um, you know, AA says it's a disease, but you know, I, I'm I'm thinking more along the lines that it's a choice that somebody's got to make. If they want to go down that path, or they don't want to go down that path. So let's talk about paths in a, in a different way. You're doing this hike. When is your Silky's hike in Nashville? Uh, Silky's hike is August 10th. Uh, it is in 11 days. It is wow. uh, not next Saturday, but the Saturday after next. And, and you've gone down this path. You, you got involved. You, you found out about it about two years ago. And then in January, you said, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. And, and throughout our discussion tonight and other communications we've had before the podcast, it really seems like this has helped you a whole lot more than you would have thought when you first started out on this. Oh, yes. I've, the, the IW family, the IW echelon, uh, upper echelon, you know, obviously, you know, it was founded by uh, Donnie O'Malley, Vet TV, and then they've got a board. Uh, but then below that, they've got Cindy, the president, and all the national hike coordinators. If you have a problem, all you have to do is call. And that right there in itself is called support. Yeah. Just like my AA sponsor, just like my vet court mentor, just like my wife, just like any of my good friends, you know, that I have or that I can call friends or, or anything like that. It's just like today, I, um, I had a problem. Uh, we're, we're, the, uh, the hike is going to start and stop at the Tennessee War Memorial in downtown Nashville. And, uh, I did not know that they needed a permit for us veterans, uh, 150 of us, to be there to register, to give speeches, to get a prayer, Pledge of Allegiance, National Anthem, and food. I didn't know there, you know, I thought, I thought it was going to be a freebie. No, no. Metro council, when I met with them three months ago, they said, they said nothing about it. Well, thank goodness I went in yesterday and I, I called them and I'm like, yeah, can I get, um, you know, 150 people in the plaza, not, not in the building <clears throat> itself, but you know, right outside. And they're like, yeah, you could do that, but you just need a permit. I was like, what? And so oh my God. basically now, I mean, I had to call Cindy, the president. I'm like, hey, Cindy, um, we need to put the Tennessee War Memorial on our certificate of liability uh, endorsement uh, or they're, they're not going to be able to do this. Well, I called her up. She took care of it. I mean, it was one phone call. And, but you know what? I didn't know what I was doing. Now I know for next year. Now I know what to do. And in, in, in a lot more – a lot less time – that it didn't help. So you you're already planning this for 2020. Oh yeah, I'm I'm already thinking about I, I'm already thinking about ideas for next year. Um, this I, I don't know I for some reason this IW has uh, this hike and, and and planning for it has kind of consumed a lot of my time, and and so I'm 100% PTSD and you know dual diagnosis of PTSD and alcoholism. I uh, the VA takes very good care of me uh i am kind of um you know all over the place uh i'm sorry about that it's just you know i see a squirrel and i'm like oh oh shit but um <laughs> sorry see exactly um but no iw has uh it's given me a, a purpose it's given me a reason um to better myself i mean being a coordinator you actually have to go talk to city officials which i did which I've done this year, which I've never been able to do in my entire life. I mean, that's a first for me. Um, getting permits for any, uh, the area where we're eating lunch at Centennial Park, which is sponsored by Mission Barbecue, by the way. Um, had to get a permit for that. Um, had to, you know, I had to use, you know, my idea, my, my experience as a chef to figure out how much food is needed to feed 150 people. Um, what kind of what kind of uh, safety concerns do we have? I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's basically like it's a SMEAC order. Um, you remember those, right? 
Situation, Mission, Execution, Administration, Command and Signals? Exactly. Wow. Man. <laughs> you know what? The only one I remember is actually Pick and Beef, and that's because I'm a machine gunner. So <laughs> I know uh, I know the S in Bansis is Supervise. I don't know anything else. I don't remember anything I, else. I, for, I forgot Bansis. Um, or um, JJ Tie Buckle. I mean, that's one. Of, that's one of them. I just, but that's an. I think that's an eleven. Oh uh, three eleven thing. Okay. I don't know. I, I pick them deep was good enough for me. Pairs, uh, interlocking fields of fire, coordination of fire, mutual support, deflate, enflate, uh, entrenchment protection. Okay. Sorry, no, you know, no, team no. leaders rule, gunners rule. I was a good. Hey, I was a good machine gunner, man. Was you? Are you on the two forty or saw? I was, uh, well, uh, when I was on a vehicle, it'd be uh, 240. Uh, when I was uh, attached to the platoon, I'd be I'd have a 249 saw, which doesn't exist anymore. I guess they got rid of that, which is horrible because I love that gun. Good, good um, the Mark 19 and the 50 cal, which I love the 50, uh, but I hate the dissonance of the 50 because that's, that's stupid. Because that's fourteen. Uh, the bull has fourteen parts to it. I mean, come on. Oh, uh, yeah, it's 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 brutal, brutal. Small parts too sometimes. Uh, yeah, uh, and if uh, if you don't, you know, if you release that uh, that spring, oh my God, that'll go right through you. Yep, yep, yep. So this hike is August tenth. You have a hundred and fifty hikers, people from the Nashville area, but. One thing I've noticed over the last couple of years following these hikes is, like you said, it's becoming a bigger thing. People, civilians yeah. know about it. Uh, other vets talk about it. It's it's a big time, and people are, can dress up, act crazy, act stupid, or get real serious. Some some people are really serious about why they hike. Some people are just trying to find like-minded souls to you know be around. Well, exactly. I mean, and that's that's what us veterans do. I mean, irreverent is basically uh, it means disrespectful, and basically, you know, we we laugh at stuff that normal people would find offensive. We think it's hilarious, True. and that's the whole thing about irreverent warriors and bringing bringing veterans together with camaraderie and humor is that civilians don't really get our humor. I mean. Uh, you know, they either think it's stupid or it's not PC or, or or anything like that. And, you know, and that's, I mean, my wife gets it because she's, you know, she's a daughter of a 38-year Air Force veteran. But uh, a lot of people, like my mother, she doesn't get any of the jokes that I laugh at. She's like, oh, my God, you should not be laughing at that. I'm like, Mom, I'm sorry. I'm not that little boy that, you know, you had, you know, at 12 and 13, you know, when I was – cute back then that that little guy he's gone he he probably is not going to come back but but in some ways you know leaving that little boy behind leaving your past behind you're yeah you're saying you're using a whole lot of your time doing the irreverent warriors hike setup but don't you find that devoting that time to this has allowed you to leave some of the you know less positive aspects of your life behind and embrace this new future? I mean, is that what, yes. that's what I'm hearing. You know? Yes, it has. And, and, and it's, um, oh, I'm sorry. No, no go no, ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. It's fine. Um, no, I mean, um, uh, you know, I, cause I, I've got a lot of hats. Um, you know, I'm adjutant for my VFW. I'm senior vice commandant for my Marine Corps league. I'm sergeant of arms for the whole state of Tennessee for the, uh, Tennessee Department, Marine Corps League, and, you know, IW coordinator. And I just, I, you know, and helping out vets is, it makes, it makes sense to me. And, it, you know, I get to give back and I get to share stories and I get to make peace with myself about all the horrible stuff that's happened with me. And, you know, and, and I have to give credit to my sponsor for actually sitting down with me and actually taking the time to, to, to finish the 12 steps of AA. And, you know, uh, step four is to make a moral inventory of yourself. And um, he said, be thorough, be very thorough. And you have to be. And I wasn't thorough the last couple of times. And it kind of dawned on me um, after I did this last time is that I, I put all my resentments and angers and, and jealousies out on a piece of paper 
And then I prayed them away in, in step five. And I don't know, it's just all this stuff, like this combination of all this support has helped me dramatically. I mean, I'm, I'm so much like, I don't know why I'm better now than I was with uh when I was with the VA for 10 years, I'm still with the VA, but I take this, this counseling, this veterans treatment court. Um, I take all this a whole hell of a lot better than I ever did with the VA. No offense to the VA, of course well, they try. Well, I got to tell you, um, just, I'm a member of my uh, local Marine Corps League, and Hoorah! I'm one of the youngest guys there. But I tell you what, those, those dudes are pretty cool, and yeah, me too. They they just kind of welcome me, and you know, even when I we'll do a ceremony, sometimes I'll mess up and I'll, I'll catch almighty hell for it, but um, it's it's all good and it's good natured ribbing, and I feel at home. I feel like I'm back with uh, family, and, and I I was. For some of them, I wasn't even alive when they were serving, but that doesn't matter. It spans generations, and it's just very cool, Andrew, to hear that that you found this way to to thrive and move forward, even though you know life has been what it has been for you, and you made choices that you probably you know didn't want to make or shouldn't have made, but you've been able to own those and move on. And it's just refreshing to hear instead of that usual um, "I'm defeated." No one likes me. I'm not going to try. I'm going to quit. And that, yeah. that's hard to work with for me. You know, uh, you know, Travis, I actually, I used to use that. I used to think that a lot. I, I actually used to use my PTSD and the problems that I have. I, I used to use it as a crutch. Okay. And um, it didn't really get me that far. Um, so maybe it helped out a little bit. But then after a while, it got boring and monotonous for other people to hear that. And I didn't really realize that until this veterans treatment court, which I don't know. I don't know if, if Boston has a, a veterans treatment court uh, up there. Um, you know, basically, it's you know it's for veterans that have you know uh, drug addictions or, or alcoholism. Uh, they have DUIs. They have small sm small charges. Nothing aggravated assault. No domestic violence. That'll keep you out of the program, but. The DUIs. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. That'd be you know. It'd be really interesting to know if Boston, and you know, or you know, Bill Rick or, or any of the towns up there have a veterans treatment court. I think I think there's something like that, or I think they do, and it's for that reason. It's for veterans uh, with minor offenses who may or may or may not be service disconnected, and they take that yeah. consideration. And as long as you come to the court and follow the courts. Uh, direction and guidelines and accountability they're going to get you back on your feet but you've got to do and that work. And that is totally true um it's funny i've got court tomorrow i'm in phase um it, there's five phases uh to mine um and it spans 18 months uh phase five is when they basically uh let you off the the choker and uh see what you do and with all these tools that you've received is he going to go back out and drink? What is he going to do? And it's, it used to be called the aftercare. It was used to be four months and then aftercare for six months. Now it's just uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, which I'm in. And I'll be in phase five, September 18th, where I don't have to, because you have to call in every single morning to listen to your phase for a drug screen. Um, you have to see the judge, depending on what phase you're in, you have to see the judge, you know, if you're in phase one, you got to see him every week, phase two, every two weeks and, and so on. Um, and I see my judge and, and my judge is a 22 year army veteran. He loves us. We've got 25 vets, uh, in our program and they range from, you know, they're all branches, mostly army, uh, two Marines, you know, uh, but the rest, you know, uh, national guard, uh, they're great people. Um, and they're, you know, great, they're great people with addictions. I love them all. And we, we all are tied to each other. We all have, we're all on the group, uh, like a group chat with our texting and, and, and uh, whatever our phones and stuff like that. So if we are in trouble, you know, we, we have like 25 people to call that can help us out. I think what I'm hearing is the kind of story I want to tell on the Oscar Mike radio podcast or, 
live cast, depending on how things go in here in the next couple of months. And and that story but, is you, you had a veteran who was at one state in their life and through whatever means they had, they reinvented themselves, they rebuilt themselves, they retooled themselves and are now doing something bigger than themselves. And I'm just very curious, uh, you know, maybe after the hike and things calm down, if you'd come back on and we talk about how your experience was on, on hike day, because I think a lot of people. Yeah, I would that. definitely love to do it. Maybe, uh, Maybe um, we can come up to now. You're in you're in Boston, right? I'm in South Florida. Oh yeah, great. Oh okay. Oh, well, actually, since I'm going to be up there in September, we'll, I would love to get you know to get to get up with you. We'll make that happen. I'll, I'll tell you right now. We'll make that happen in that week, and uh, we'll catch up face to face, and definitely spend some time going over what you felt during that time. It's a big deal for you. I will. I would. Uh, I wish. I wish I could. Um, Maybe we can get the coordinator for um, for Boston uh, to come with. Uh, his name is uh, James Shore, and his uh, hike know, in Boston is August 24th, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I know James. Uh, you know, we've talked before about a couple of things. I know he does the – Oh, good. Uh, yep, yep, yep. So uh, we'll, we'll get that Marine – we'll get three Marines in the same room and make – excuse me. We'll get, oh, that's, oh, dude, that's going to be that's going to be a mess. That's, that's going to be a lot three, of swearing. Three Marines in the same room. We can get some stuff done. We can, we can, we can, I, we can I think some, so. Yeah. <laughs> That's we'll a good some, one. Charlie. We'll mess some stuff up for sure. Yes, sir. Well, I just, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, it, there's a lot going on. You've got a lot going on. I know we've, we've talked and it's like, you know, I'm doing this and doing that, but talking to you gives me hope that some other veteran will hear this and maybe, you, you know, own their problems, own their solution and, and make something of themselves, man. And it's just encouraging to hear that somebody, you know, did what you're doing. And, and to me, people talk about heroes and, and, and this and that. But, you know, to me, guys like you are really the savage badasses out there. And I really thank you for coming on the podcast and talking with me. Hey, Travis, thank you so much for having me. I know uh, we were going back and forth for a little bit, but uh, I'm glad uh, I'm Simply glad we got to, to do this. You, uh, you seem me. pretty locked on, and, and I love your show, man. I love it. Well, um, folks, we're going to catch up with Andrew in September on Oscar Mike Radio. You can check out the Silkies page. Uh, I'll have a link to that in the blog post. Great having you on. Can't wait to catch up again. And I feel like I've gained uh, another friend and brother. I, I just love it. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. All right, folks, we're going to wind down this uh, podcast number 158. And we are on the move. Lock through lunch. <laughs>